Hello there, YouTube. My name is Noah Meyer. You may know me from the channel Lovebird Fan Dubs or from my work on the Lloyd the Monkey video game series. But that's not why we're here today. I just want to take a moment to welcome you all to the first episode of what I hope will be a long running analytical series titled The Sailor Moon Study Sessions. Let's just sum up what we'll be doing here before we get started. The Sailor Moon Study Sessions are similar in premise to Mystere Fusion's Dragon Ball Dissection series, which you should check out, by the way. In this series, I'll be reading all 12 volumes of Naoko Takeuchi's iconic manga a series, Sailor Moon, as well as watching all 200 episodes of the TV series, and then critiquing both piece by piece. Just to make things clear, I'm a fan of the franchise, but I'm going to be treating this as objectively as possible, considering I have not read past the Dark Kingdom arc. And my order for critique will go as such. Before we actually start, I just want to make things 100% clear. I will be using Kodansha's translation of the manga that was released in 2011 as my frame of reference. And when we do get to the television series, I intend to alternate between the original Japanese version and the Viz Media dub that began in 2014. So I will not be using any name changes that came from Disney's dub of the series. With that said, I hope everyone's ready to jump back into the adventures of the Sailor Guardians because we are going to start at the very beginning. The Dark Kingdom arc. So let's get going. I feel the best writers should be able to effectively sum up their characters within a reasonably short period of time. And while I have my own problems with the manga's pacing in general, I think Takeuchi does a great job telling us about Asagi Tsukino, our protagonist, in just four pages. She's a heavy sleeper, she tends to miss class, and she's a bit of an airhead, as her run-in with a bandaged can on the road seems to suggest. She also performs rather poorly in school, much to the irritation of her teacher, Miss Haruna Sakurada. And I'm going to jump the gun on something here and keep this in mind once we get the ball rolling. Outside the central cast, I feel most of the characters are underutilized in the manga. Especially Miss Sakurada, who only shows up for one page of this arc, and I strongly suspect that she's only here as fan service for those who have read The Cherry Project, a figure skating manga that was also written by Takeuchi. Well, on the flip side, I like to think that Usagi's classmates, Naru Osaka and Guryo Umino, fare better than Ms. Haruna, and at least provide means for exposition later down the road. Now, believe it or not, Naru actually plays a pretty big role in this first chapter. You see, her mother runs a rather large jewelry store in their neighborhood, the Juban District. However, Mrs. Osaka has been acting rather strange lately. Apparently, under normal circumstances, she would never even consider having a sale in the store, which is what she's doing right now. Well, whatever the case, poor Usagi can't take advantage of it, having spent all her allowance for the month. So after a run-in with Mr. Fancy Tuxedo Guy, she heads home. Of course, naturally, Tuxedo Guy is interested in the store too. What a show-off. Well, enough about belligerent sexual tension, but does anyone remember the cat from earlier in the chapter? Well, she's a talking cat and her name is Luna, and she was looking all over the Juban district for Usagi. Why? To give her a prey brooch, why else? Eh, to be fair, it's a transformation trinket. It's triggered by the phrase, Moon Prism Power Makeup. Because of the brooch, Usagi finds herself in a new outfit, and through the magical mask that comes with it, she learns that Naru is being attacked by her own mother. Well, not quite. You see, this is a Yoma, a kind of demonic spirit. It took the form of Naru's mother and distributed energy siphoning jewelry to the store's regular customers, hypnotizing them in the process. 
Speaking of which, I find the best thing about Sailor Moon as a superhero to be the fact that she starts out as a talentless ditz. She gets a blade knee right away when the brainwashed patrons show up, and unlike Spider-Man or Iron Man, she doesn't get the edge until someone shows up to help her. In this case, Tuxedo Guy telling her when an opening pops up from the ultrasonic whale she gives out. Using that opening and a moon tiara boomerang, the Yoma is sliced in two. And Tuxedo Guy gives his name as Tuxedo Mask as he flees the scene. Honestly, it's a miracle Zuggy didn't recognize him from earlier that day. Act 1 bridges into Act 2 by having Jadeite, one of the series' villains, being chewed out by his superior Queen Beryl for failing to find the legendary Silver Crystal, which was mentioned a couple times beforehand in Act 1. On that note, I really like how Takeuchi's sense of lighting and framing sells Beryl and Jadeite as a threat, but I'll say more about them later. For now, I want to highlight Ami Mizuno, the next protagonist who appears in the story. Ami has a reputation as the ice-cold genius girl of class 5, who always places us on top of the school leaderboards and goes to the fancy new cram school called the Crystal Seminar. Though, of course, the story is very quick to demolish any notion of Ami being ice-cold, as she quickly makes friends with Usagi and discovers she's actually pretty good at video games, being rewarded a pen for getting a high score on the Sailor V arcade game. Granted, Usagi gets a pen of her own by smacking the machine, which is actually pretty funny. Anyway, back to the Crystal Seminar. The study sessions all involve computers and apparently top-of-the-line programs designed specifically for studying. At least that's what the advertising claims. Naturally, both Luna and Tuxedo Guy are both suspicious of the place, and it's not like they were wrong. The programs are actually brainwashing disks Jadeite had created to gather energy for some sort of great ruler. Honestly, I find it kind of funny that this is re revealed by repeating the Usagi thinks something will happen when she smacks the machine gag from earlier. And on top of that, making use of how seriously Japanese students take their education was a pretty smart move on Jadeite's part. Especially since th shows like Madoka Magica are all too happy to show that this can lead to disaster. Now that Jadeite's scheme is revealed, Usagi is worried about Ami's safety, so she uses her new transformation pen to break into the Crystal Seminar and confront the teacher. To nobody's surprise, the teacher is a Yoma. And since this is the last time we're going to see a Yoma in the manga, now's a good time for me to ask something that's been on my mind recently. Are the Yoma supposed to be like pod people, like in all the different versions of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? I mean, the Yoma are disguised as civilians, and for all we know, they copy someone then kill them. The Yoma from Act 1 took the form of Naru's mother, after all, and likely would have kept the jig up for, lo for as long as possible had Naru not barged in on her. And since we don't see any more Yoma in the series after this, I eh, can't help but wonder. But enough about movie ramblings. Once Ami is aware of the situation, her pen starts to glow and it releases a cloud of ice-cold mist that blinds nearly everyone in the area. Which is when Tuxedo Mask shows up to give Sailor Moon an opening to cut the Yoma apart again. In her position, I'd appreciate the help, but I would start to question why Tuxedo Mask shows up for two minutes and then flees the scene. Oh, whatever. Once the mist dispersed afterwards, Usagi finds Ami in a new outfit, because she is Sailor Mercury, the second guardian. I honestly like this development, because the story is suggesting that just because someone has latent powers resting inside them, that doesn't mean they're going to know how to use them. And since Ami's going to figure out how to make mist clouds voluntarily later in the story, there's a sense of progression here that I really like. Speaking of progression, Jadeite is in real trouble now since Queen Beryl is starting to lose her patience with him. But only after two screw-ups? That's a bit fast for someone to decide that their subordinate is incompetent. I mean, I'm not a criminal mastermind. But I would say something closer to 15 screw-ups would be a better measurement of incompetence. And on a related note, I sure as heck wouldn't listen to someone else showing up to both said, Well, of course you're going to fail, your Yoma are made of clay. Anyway, said someone else is Nephrite, another member of the Dark Kingdom's self professed four heavenly kings, which is a term originating from mythology and used more loosely here. I really like Nephrite as a villain. I feel Jadeite is effective, but Nethrite, on the other hand, is my favorite of the four heavenly kings. Eh, my sentiments mostly come from the television series, I'll admit that, but let's cross that bridge when we get there.
Queen Barrel does something sensible and brushes off Nephrite's offers to take over Jadeite's operations. For now, anyway. And gives him one final chance to defeat the Sailor Guardians. His plan? Drive a bus and lure as many hostages as possible into the Dark Kingdom so he can defeat the Guardians on his own turf, and then sacrifice them to the Great Ruler. Smart plan. And it causes problems for Rei Hino, a priestess at the local Hikawa Shrine. So Usagi and Luna set off to investigate and bump into... Tuxedo Guy? Isn't it a little weird that he's always... Oh, hey, I can stop calling him Tuxedo Guy now. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mamoru Chiba, a third year at the Juban District's pub public high school. He's not a bad looking guy, and in fact he looks a bit like Tuxedo Mask. On top of that, he seems to be well informed about the bus situation. Gee, where's this going? Eventually, Jadite uses teleconnect manipulation on Rei, allowing him to capture her on his hostage gathering trips. I'll admit it does make more sense than a black hole from the TV series, though I do have to question how that would work on a Shinto priestess. Wouldn't Rei have some sort of resistance to telekinesis? Well, conveniently, Usagi saw what was going on and hopped on the bus herself, and once Ami teleports onto the scene, they confront Jadeite. What I like about this is that while Jadeite is way out of their league, it takes Rei breaking free of Jadeite's grasp to gain the advantage. Also brilliant is how his cockiness proves to be his own undoing, as he catches the Moon TR boomerang, allowing Sailor Moon to bind him and leave him open for a newly transformed Sailor Mars to ruthlessly incinerate him. There's play of tactical creativity present in the fight on the Guardian's end, and combine that with Mars' firepower, it really gives Nephrite a scare.